welcome okay today let's get right into it I've been saying I'm gonna do this video for a little while now and I finally have I decided to delve into the quartz crisis and check it out for myself because as you know if you watch this channel this whole watch thing love them have for years but haven't really learned a lot about them and this has been the year of a journey including discovering and learning about the quartz crisis <laughs> so before we get right into it let's roll the intro all right wrist check today is my panerai 422 uh, 47 millimeters uh, with oem strap today uh, and you guys you guys know i love that watch so i don't need to go into many more detail about it oh okay so it wouldn't be a video unless of course we did a little bit of history now as i've tried to explain in the past and as people who watch this channel regularly are going to understand that i uh am not a watch expert i never pro profess to be uh, this is my channel where i get to learn about watches so i can actually understand in, in a lot more detail the intricacies, the origin, origins, and you know stuff like that about watches that I didn't, you know, already know, uh, other than just thinking that something's a pretty watch. Because basically, I'm going to be honest with you, that was my criteria for a very long time. Uh, and as I've progressed on this journey, I've learned so much about the history and origins of different watch brands, watches themselves. And in that journey, the quartz crisis has cropped up on many occasions. So let's get into it, shall we, with the rise and origins of watches. So in, in World War I, there was a, a demand for a timekeeping that was far more practical than the typical pocket watch that people had been uh, using uh, for you know, years and years prior. And uh, we've talked about it in terms of like field watches and the origins of that but basically people needed something that was um, on their wrist rather than in their pocket and so that's kind of the um, the origins of a wristwatch per se now during the Second World War the Swiss industry grew exponentially now that was because everyone knows the joke about I'm Switzerland when there's an argument because Switzerland is neutral and by that I mean they don't take sides I know it sounds silly but in effect what that meant was they were able to continue manufacturing watches for the consumer market during this period where other countries were basically required out of necessity to manufacture weapons ammunitions or other other such items that were needed in order to fight and live through the war. Now, at the end of World War II, 95% of all mechanical watches came from Switzerland. That, my friends, is what we call a monopoly. Tens of thousands of people worked. About, I think they say about 95,000 people at the time worked in the watchmaking labor market. It was intensive work that was labor intensive. Now, <laughs> that usually spells disaster and we'll kind of go through that uh, as, as we get through this video, but think about that for a moment, shall we? 95,000 people undertook labor intensive work in the watchmaking industry. Some of you will probably be like, and others, others I think are gonna know where I'm going here. So in enters a new era. It's the 1970s. So the Swiss watchmaking market since the end of the World War have been prominent, correct? So I've just told you 95% of watches are coming out of there as of the end of World War II. So there is an era of decadence for Swiss watchmaking, obviously, post-World War II era. Until we hit the 1970s. And on Christmas Day in 1969, so I'm still going to call it the 70s because we're a week off, Japanese watch brand Seiko 
introduced the world's first quartz watch, the Astron. And instead of a mechanical movement, which we all know what that is now because I've done the research <laughs> to learn because I was the stupid one that didn't know, uh, it featured battery power instead. <laughs> now, this was seen as kind of like this alluring, futuristic new technology, right? Of quartz watches. And they, they kind of rapidly grain, gained mass appeal because why else do you think that was, guys? cost and durability because they were more to, more affordable than most mechanical and automatic watches they were also sturdy and very very accurate <laughs> and whilst the manufacture of mechanical and automatic watches had come leaps and bounds from the early days when watches were solely built by hand quartz watches were still far easier and cost efficient to produce. This is the key factor, right? Like in any manufacturing process. So soon the existing market, the Swiss watch market in particular, took a major hit. They struggled to compete with price, precision and production of quartz watches. And they resisted, of course they did, the new technology. Uh, so let me just talk about that because we're talking here about technology and tradition and the way we've always done things. Who's heard that a million times over? I know I have, particularly in my former corporate life. So I used to work for a great company, uh, a very large steel manufacturer and products uh, company here in Australia. But they, like everyone else, fell victim to this mentality. So let's call it just over a decade ago, but it was a little bit before that. The company was in crisis. They were losing billions of dollars a year. Why was that? Because we were fat and happy because we'd done things a certain way for so many years that people in high positions didn't want to change, didn't think they had to change. That was the critical factor, I think, until they were brought to their knees. And it took new management to come in and go, hey, hey guys, time out. We have to close certain plant. Certain plant that other people said they would never ever have to change. Potentially because of a little bit of arrogance. But in anyway, there are a lot of parallels between reading about uh, the Swiss watchmaking industry during this quartz crisis and what happened at that company that I worked for. And it's a common story among many manufacturers uh, when they've gone through that, that critical point of change where you have to iterate and innovate to survive. And you can't do things the same way you've always done things for the last 20, 30, 40, 50, even 100 years. And this is what happened. So basically the Swiss watch market fell to its knees. Good old Seiko. <laughs> but what happened was because, you know, it was unsustainable, right? So some of the Swiss watchmakers started to cave. It took them a few years, but a lot quicker than I thought it would for some of them. For example, in 1970, Hamilton released the Pulsar. The watch was not only quartz, but it was also digital as opposed to analog. So that was just kind of a nod to this new Fandangle era um, in terms of style and form too, I guess. And then in 74, Omega unveiled the Marine Chronometer, the first quatch, the first quatch, the first quartz watch that was COSC certified. And two years later, Omega debuted yet another quartz offering. The, qu the, the Quono, the Chrono Quartz was the first analog digital chronograph with a quartz movement. Still, panic-stricken Swiss watchmaking industry continued as a whole. They feared the quartz crisis might mean the end of centuries of watchmaking tradition. And ultimately that turned out to be a concern that was unfounded, but it's, you know, people don't like change effectively. So Seiko was not only the first quartz watchmaker to release quartz technology, it was also the reigning leader. Uh, so in, this is great facts. So in 1977, they became the world's largest company in terms of revenue, 
totaling 700 million with production of roughly 8 million pieces. Oh, think about that for a minute because that's 1977, that's 700 million in 1977 terms. So I couldn't tell you the inflationary figure for that, but it's huge. And 8 million pieces is also astronomical. Okay, how did we save? I say we, but it wasn't me. How did they save the Swiss watchmaking industry? Other than changing attitude, which, is, which was a huge thing, it actually required some significant intervention. It was spearheaded by two men, at least to begin with, and that was Ernst Tomke, I hopefully spelt that right, uh, said that right, and Nicholas J. Hayek. Now, Tomke struck... Tom, Tomke, he tackled uh, restructuring at ASUAG, and that's one of the largest Swiss watch making industry groups at the time. He worked to streamline, reorganize and cut production costs that led to the first glimmer of hope for the Swiss watch making industry since the quartz crisis began. So yep, that's usually what happened guys. You got to streamline and innovate on your process. In watchmaking, one of those I would imagine in particular would be the labor intensive nature of the work. You have to cut costs again, that, that links to a whole raft of things, including labor, but it could, could be energy, it could be a number of things, right? And, uh, and then streamlining process. So it's a no brainer, but I totally get how they got to this point because I've seen it in action. Okay, the banks were still forced to come in they had to bail out the watch industry groups in an attempt to salvage the Swiss country's third largest export industry. That also makes sense. So the bank sought help from a guy named Hayek. Hopefully I've pronounced that right because this guy seems like a genius and I want to get that right. He was one of the owners of Switzerland's top consulting firms. He once described himself, and I love this, as an impatient dreamer. <laughs> And he found two ways out of the crisis. His idea was to unite the brands of the two large watch groups. That was the ASUAG, the one that um, Tomke helped streamline and get more cost effective, and SSIH. And they put them under one umbrella and they developed a new offering of Swiss quality at a low price. Guess what that group was called, everyone? You got it, the Swatch Group. <laughs> and that was born out of a banking agreement with Nicholas at the helm. Pretty cool, huh? Everyone gives Swatch a hard time, but they were the ones that saved the industry. I mean, it's, it's typical, right? All right, so after a short period of R&D, Hayek had quartz and automatic movements built in plastic cases, and he launched huge numbers of Swatch watches on the international market. He also pursued a provocative marketing campaign which was extremely unusual for the Swiss watchmaking industry. Swatch watches were flat, light, colourful and shrill, and he decided on which designs would go into production himself. So talk about hands-on, right? In the lower price segment, Swatch watches were a direct competition to watches from Japan, i.e. Seiko. And it, it basically made Swiss watches cool again. And the great success of Swatch watches formed the financial basis for the revival of the once great traditional brands. They laid the foundation with luxury brands such as Longjins and Omega, marking the center and top of the business. The idea known as the Hayek Pyramid was born. Now today, the Swatch Group also includes brands like Glashut Original, Blancpain, Tissot, Sertina, and Hamilton. Nicholas passed away in 2010 and his son, now runs the company in Switzerland. Now Hayek and the banks weren't the only people who were responsible for the great revival of the Swiss watchmaking industry. A young man named Jean-Claude Biver, he bought the rights to the battered Blancpain brand in 82. And he joined Hayek and the team and with Blancpain and later Zenith. But Jean-Claude again relied on mechanical luxury watches and promoted them with mantra-like terms like handicraft, tradition and eternity to evoke that emotion that people once had with what it meant to have a Swiss made watch. And for Jean-Claude, he kind of took it beyond the functional 
timepiece, his philosophy still bears fruit today. He's still an active manager uh, in the Swiss watch industry. He's the non-executive president of the watch division of the French LVMH conglomerate. So three watch brands, Tag Heuer, Zenith and Hublot. Now Swiss watchmaking industry is more successful today than ever. Sales have risen worldwide for years. In 2018, watches, watches worth 21 billion Swiss francs were exported. I mean, that's huge, guys, huge. Sales are particularly strong in Hong Kong, China and the US, also the UK, Japan and Singapore. The industry was able to create 3,000 new jobs and counting. Now with Nicholas and Jean-Claude, the great world of watches would be a much poorer one today. The revival of the industry that had already been declared dead was brought back to life. So let's let's have a quick chat about that, shall we? Uh, you know, so I've read a lot about this just in passing or I've seen videos that mention the quartz crisis and everyone talks about how bad it was and please don't get me wrong. I used to be an employment lawyer, I used to work in HR. I have had to uh, restructure companies and as a consequence, many, many people have um, had their positions made redundant and they've lost their jobs. I know how awful and difficult that is. And of course, that is a, um, a consequence of the quartz crisis, uh, for sure, and people would have been so negatively impacted by that. But change is always inevitable, unfortunately, in that regard, but also positively in the regard of innovating and creating and becoming more efficient, creating better productivity and better processes, and as a result, making something stronger. So I think from that point of view, the quartz crisis was revolutionary. It changed the watchmaking industry I think most likely for the better because it made watches more accessible to everyone. And I think that's a good thing. There are watches that are not accessible to everyone that still remain in play versus everyday watches versus mid, mid to high tier to astronomical. And so from that point of view, I do honestly think that the quartz crisis was a positive impact on watchmaking. In, in an overall sense. And I just wanna understand whether people have a similar view or a contrary view to that. Uh, and you know, let me know what you think. Let me know whether you think we should just let them die <laughs> um, or whether you think they would have come good anyway, which in my view, no, that would not have happened because uh, as I've explained earlier in my practical <laughs> real life experience that's not what happens just sitting on your hands and thinking we are the best and we always will be kind of mentality it just doesn't work like that uh, you know we're in a global economy now so there's a whole raft of different factors and i think it's allowed them to continue to iterate I iterate i should say um over the years for the good i mean you could just look at the story on Hublot. Whether you love them or hate them or not, you know, that also has brought a whole new market to watches. So, you know, the numbers are extraordinary in terms of the current um, watch climate. And I'll talk about that in a separate video. We'll go back to the good old Rolex chestnut about investments, etc., etc. But um, yeah, let me know what you think, guys. As always, subscribe, like, do all those things if you haven't already. Tell your friends about me. <laughs> um, share, comment, and until next time, have a great one.